Next up, we have another talk that was rescheduled from the 2022 JMM special session on recent advances in packing. Our speaker is Zilin Zhang, who is an assistant professor at Arizona State. Professor Zhang studies discrete geometry, extremal graph theory, and topological combinatorics. Today, he'll tell us about two distant sets. Take it away, Zilin. Um. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Dustin, for the uh, kind introduction. <clears throat> and uh, it's so great to so, uh, see so many familiar uh, people today. Uh, so this is a joint work with uh, Sasha Poliansky, uh, Jonathan Tito, uh, Yao Yuan, Zhang Shentong, and uh, Zhao Yufei at MIT. Um, and I will start my talk with a constant. Okay, so, you know, this is a constant that's defined in this algebraic way. Uh, it's the root of beta plus the reciprocal of that, where beta is the only the unique real root of the cube equation, uh, x cubed equals x plus one. But, you know, I don't expect you to, you know, remember the, all the details, but keep in mind that this is just a constant that is slightly larger than two. Okay, that's all I want you to, to know. And if you have good memory, you can memorize it up to several digits. So here it is, 2.0198, et cetera, okay? And as the title suggests, uh, I'm going to talk about two things. Uh, so let me start with forbidden subgraphs, okay? So, you know, as we know, we can associate a matrix, uh, actually a couple of different matrices uh, to a graph. And in particular, in this talk, I want to focus on the adjacency matrices, namely, you know, if there is no edge, then the entry is zero. If there is an edge, the entry is one. So here's an example. Suppose your graph G is a complete graph on N vertices. Then you would imagine, you know, the adjacency matrix to form is almost all one matrix, but you know, the diagonals are all reset to zero. So it's J minus I, um, and hence the smallest segment. So I also want to you know, kind of understand the eigenvalues uh, of the, this matrix. Um, and in particular, I want to focus on smallest eigenvalue and the smallest eigenvalue of this matrix J minus I is minus one. And this minus one actually has a, a huge amount of multiplicity. I believe it's multiplicity is N minus one. So here's the answer example. Um, and there is a kind of a theme in spectral graph theory, which is to classify graphs with bounded eigenvalues. So here's a class of graphs that I'm interested in. I want to you know, look at all graphs whose smallest eigenvalue is bounded from below. And here I use minus lambda because I really want you to think about lambda being a positive number. You know, normally, you know, smallest eigenvalue is a negative number. So hence at least minus lambda. And here's the observation, right? So if you look at you know, the adjacency matrix of a graph, and you take uh, a principal sum matrix of that, then the smallest eigenvalue of the sub matrix will be at least the smallest eigenvalue of the original matrix. So that's a, like an easy corollary of Cauchy interlacing theorem. And the, a graph theoretic way to interpret that is to say, well, this family of graphs is close undertaking subgraph. Namely, you know, if you have a graph whose smallest gain value is already at least minus lambda, then taking any subgraph of that graph will still have smallest uh, eigen value at least minus lambda. The smallest gain value does not decrease when you take a subgraph. And throughout the talk, all subgraphs will be induced. So kind of here's a natural question, like you, you know, if you know something is close under taking certain operation, you want to know whether you can define this class of structures by forbidding certain substructures. Okay, so in this context, 
you know, I'd like to ask whether we can, you know, define this family of graphs by forbidding some amount of subgraphs. And the first thing I want to tell you is that sometimes this question is quite kind of easy. So let me show you a simple case for lambda less than one, okay? So pick your favorite number that is less than one, maybe 0.9, okay? Now you have a class of graphs with smallest eigenvalue at least minus 0.9. And now you kind of want to define it by saying, okay, actually this family of graphs is all graphs without having certain subgraphs, okay? Well, what kind of subgraph will not occur uh, in this family G of you know, 0.9. In other words, like which graph uh, has smallest eigenvalue less than minus lambda? Uh, the complete graph. Exactly. That comes back to the, you know, what we saw. And in particular, you know, you don't need to take a large complete graph, like take K2, you know, complete graph on two vertices. Smallest eigenvalue is minus one. Hence K2 is a you know, is a graph that we can forbid. Well, but if I forbid a K2 that is an, an edge in a graph, then, you know, all graphs, uh, you know, normally has edges except the, you know, the empty graph. But if you look empty graph, then the smallest signal value is zero, hence it's inside G of lambda, okay? So therefore, G of lambda are all graphs with no edges. Forbidding K2 defines, you know, G of lambda for the simple case. So, you know, a toy example to keep in mind. Um, well, but actually this question, you know, whether can, can you define G of lambda by forbid, forbidden subgraphs is, has a trivial answer. Because you can always answer tautologically by saying, well, I'm just gonna forbid all graphs outside G of lambda. Hence, whatever is left is inside G of lambda. But that's not what we want, right? Um, so the correct question is the following asked by Booth Marker and Newmile in back in 92. They said, you know, can you actually define G of lambda by finite forbidden subgraphs? So you are not allowed to forbid everything outside G of lambda because that's going to be infinity. Uh, you can only forbid finite. And uh, we see an answer for lambda less than one. And the answer to, you know, for those lambdas is yes to this question. Okay. And uh, we know a bit more about this question. For example, when lambda is equal to two, well, we actually know the answer. So, you know, first of all, G of two is quite a complex class of graphs. First of all, it contains all the line graphs. I'm not going to give you a proof of that. It's a good exercise. And also we have a classification uh, theorem uh, for all graphs with smallest eigenvalue at least minus two. In particular, this beautiful theorem by Cameron Gothos, uh, uh, Seidel and Schutt tells us that every connected graph in G2, G of two, uh, is either something called represented by a subset of DN or E8. These are root systems, okay? But you know, if you haven't seen them, basically think of this, the class of uh, graphs that can be represented by a subset of DN as some generalization of line graphs. And sometimes they are called generalized line graphs. And the graphs can, that can be represented by E8 are very exceptional. There are only finitely of those. And with this like, kind of complete understanding of all graphs in G of two, um, people then can prove that actually G of two can be defined by forbidden subgraphs with at most 10 vertices. So basically, you, know, you look at all graphs outside G of two with at most 10 vertices, forbid all of those. And you get, a, you know, what's left is precisely G of two. Hence, you know, there are only finitely many graphs with at most 10 vertices. Hence, we know that the answer is yes for lambda uh, equals two. 
So, you know, both Michael and uh, Numa remarked that, you know, this seems to be very difficult problems. And uh, uh, this year uh, with uh, Sasha, we managed to show that uh, the answer to this question is yes, if and only if lambda is less than lambda star, the constant that I asked you to kind of memorize at the beginning of the talk. Okay. And there's a very clean threshold phenomena. Once you stay below the threshold 2.019, the answer is yes, you can characterize using finitely many forbidden subgraphs. Otherwise, the answer is no. And uh, just to show you, actually, the proof is not that easy. Uh, these are the, we kind of examined 30, these 31 graphs in our proof, just uh, to show you uh, that, you know, the proof is kind of complicated. But, you know, let me not go into the proof. Um, so you might ask, you know, why do you care about uh, this problem? Uh, actually, who cares? Um, well, you know, let me explain a, a little bit further. So, you know, our proof technique can be used to, uh, can be generalized for sign graphs. So sign graphs are, you know, graphs, but where the edges can be negative edges. Hence in your adjacency matrix or actually called signed adjacency matrix, you can have minus one entries. So not only you can have zero or one, but also minus one. And you can, you know, define similarly the a family, you know, take all sine graphs with smallest eigenvalue bounded from below by minus lambda. And the same question, right? So can you define, you know, by forbidding, uh, actually finite uh, forbidden subgraphs? Um, the answer is the same. Okay? Yes, uh, lambda less than the, the constant. And similarly, you know, you can also define a, a family where the largest eigenvalue is at most lambda. Actually here, it's just a corollary of the previous. So because if you negate all edges uh, of, a, of a sine graph uh, with largest eigenvalue at most lambda, so if you, you know, negate any graph in this G minus plus of lambda, then you end up with a graph in G plus minus lambda of lambda. So there's kind of like a duality between the two families. Hence, you know, it's a corollary, uh, you know, you ask the same question and the, the, as a corollary, you know, the answer is yes. So this last question is, you know, kind of question that we were interested in because of a connection with spherical two distance set. And I will explain the connection uh, at, towards the end of the talk. Okay, but you know, all the results I mentioned doesn't matter except the last one, right? So sine graphs with larger sigma value at most lambda, answer is yes. You can define by finite forbidden subgraphs if and only if lambda is less than lambda star. Okay, uh, but maybe for some of the audience, uh, you know, you know who are you know maybe teach linear algebra. Here is actually a cool you know application of our result that maybe you can you know tell your students uh, who are taking linear algebra so here's an application right so you know you pick your favorite lambda less than lambda star maybe 2 1.9 who knows uh, you can always find an you know a constant n which depends only on lambda such that you can do the following you know consider any uh, symmetric integer matrix with zeros on the diagonal, okay? And this kind of matrix is known as hollow matrix, but, you know, with integer uh, entries and symmetric. And if you ever want to test whether the smallest eigenvalue of A is at least minus lambda, all you need to do is to go through all the principal sub matrix of order at most n and check whether their smallest eigenvalue is at least minus lambda. Okay. So in particular, you know, if for lambda equals two, two this is a result of uh, Vijay Kuma back in 87. You can, you only need to check for principal sum matrices of order at most 10. Okay. So given a matrix, if you want to know it's whether its smallest eigenvalue is at least minus two, 
all you need to do is to go through all the principal sum matrices of all the 10 and check whether their smallest eigenvalue is at least minus two. And in some sense, you know, you can tell people that you see, you know, to check whether, you know, the smallest eigenvalue of a matrix is at least minus two, there's a n to the 10 polynomial time algorithm to do that. Okay, so any questions before I move on to you know, talk about um, spherical two distance set? Okay, I will move on. Um, so next up, spherical two distance set. So it's a set of unit vectors, hence you know the name spherical in. Euclidean space Rd, where the pairwise inner product between these vectors is either alpha or beta. And I'd like to focus on the case where alpha and beta are fixed. So, and one is positive and the other is negative. Hence, you know, that you can think of the angles between the vectors and the angles are, you know, one acute and one obtuse. So, and of course, I want to maximize, you know, the number of unit vectors that I can, you know, pack into RD uh, in this way, right? Where, you know, the pairwise in the product is either alpha or beta. I want to maximize the size. So I, you know, this is the definition of the function and I want to kind of understand this, this number. The problem is about you know determining the this function for large dimension, and somehow we know that actually this function behaves linearly as d grows. Therefore, at least as a first uh, you know order approximation, we want to know you know the linear coefficient in front of d. So we would like to know that you know the limit of this function over d. So here is something we know, uh, together with Jonathan uh, uh, Yuan uh, Shentong and Yu Fei. Um, a year ago, we kind of uh, we, we settled the equiangular uh, equiangular case, namely when beta is minus alpha. Okay, and over there the results it looks like following. So this function, oh, I'm missing a d here, but when alpha is equal to minus beta, or beta is minus alpha, the answer is something times d, where something is k over k minus one, and the k is something called spectral radius order of something you can calculate from alpha. Okay. Uh, don't be bothered by this spectral radius, but only thing you need to know is that it's a uh, natural number, at least two. Hence, as you can see here, you know the best thing, you know, the largest, coefficient you can get here is two over two minus one, hence two, right? So normally you get something smaller, but the best thing you can do is two D plus big O of one. And I will use that to compare with the spherical two distance set. Okay, so after this work, we you know, want to further capitalize on the technique that we developed. So naturally we look at the more general case where beta is not, may not be equal to minus half. Oh, here's a picture of the group. Uh, this is Jonathan Yufei and uh, Yao Yu and uh, Zhang Shentong. And these two are undergrads. Um, so again, back to the question. Uh, in a follow-up work, we did the following three things. First of all, you know, for you know the non-equiangular line case, we developed a lower bound. You know, you start with a construction and you say, you know, probably this is the best you can do, right? So we had a construction for spherical alpha beta code. And this, alpha, you know, this lower bound has a very special feature. The lower bound only depends, of course, it depends on alpha and beta. But actually, its behavior only depends on these two parameters that can be derived from alpha and beta, okay, p and lambda. And you know, I'm not going to show this formula again, but somehow, you know, once you're given alpha and beta, you can derive this P and lambda. And this is not a bijection. So actually, you know, for different pairs of alpha beta, you can get the same set of P and lambda, but somehow we, 
you know, the lower bound we constructed only depend only depends on p and lambda, but not kind of you know. So in some sense, p and lambda is the we we think it's the key parameters to the problem rather than you know alpha and beta. And then we prove a matching upper bound uh, for large D when P is either one or two. You can think of this as the equal angle line case because you know when beta is minus alpha, P is equal to two. So this, this case where P is either one or two is kind of you know, susceptible to equal angle line techniques. And we also prove some sporadic cases where lambda square is one or two or three. And in particular, you know, for example, when alpha is 2 over 5, 0.4, and beta is point, minus 0.2, you get this very special behavior where you know, the leading coefficient in front of D is 3. And uh, in comparison with the equal angle line case, you never get any constant larger than 2. Right? But spherical two distance set can have very different behavior. And you know that's almost all about the, that paper. But at the end, we conjecture you know the lower bound is tight for large D. In other words, people should be able to prove matching upper bound for large D uh, without these constraints. Okay. So how do you get an upper bound on um, you know this function? First of all, you start with a spherical code. You kind of can turn it into a graph. Let me not dig into this, but th this is a very standard process. And then we prove some structure theorem about this graph, namely that you can have some large constant delta, which only depends on alpha and beta. And G, you know, you can remove some vertices from G, but after that, G looks almost like a p-partite complete graph K. Okay. So here the technical term is data modification, which means that you, know, you can start with this p partite complete graph. At every vertex, you can modify edges, uh, that at most data edges or non edges. And after that, uh, you get G, then you say G is a data modification of complete p partite graph K. Okay. So since you know, G looks almost like this p partite complete graph, then we just naturally work with the difference between the graph G and the complete graph K. Hence, actually, that is a sine graph, okay, G plus minus. And how does this connect to the forbidden subgraph um, framework? Uh, you know, uh, forbidden subgraph um, result that I mentioned earlier. Well, in the same paper, we established some framework that incorporates this forbidden subgraph idea. So here is kind of the way to phrase it. You can, you know, provide a finite family of sine graphs H, where every graph, every sine graph in this H has largest eigenvalue bigger than lambda. Okay, and once you provide this family H, then it's possible to go back to step two and choose a very large delta, such that. The sine graph G plus minus you get in step three does not contain any member in H. Okay. So now do you see the connection with the previous route? So a quick flashback, right? So we had this family G minus plus where you know, it consists of sine graphs with largest eigenvalue at most delta or lambda. And then I can define this family by finite forbidden sine graphs, sine subgraphs, uh, if lambda is less than lambda star, you know, two point oh something. So coming back to you know, what we were doing, well, for lambda less than lambda star, now I can choose H, which is the forbidden characterization of all sine graphs with largest eigenvalue at most lambda, which is finite. And then choose the delta such that the G plus minus I get from step three has largest eigenvalue at most lambda. Okay. And from there, it's easy to finish argument. So as a you know, result, uh, we find a matching upper bound for large D whenever D is less than lambda star. Okay. 
So let me end my talk with a couple of open questions. Uh, so as you can see, somehow this lambda star is, you know, graphs with smallest eigenvalue at least minus lambda star is a special class of graphs. Uh, by the beautiful theorem and the account of camera and all, we kind of understand all graphs with small x eigenvalue at least minus two. So uh, to me, it's kind of hopeful that we probably can also extend the theorem beyond minus two, namely, you know, here's a question. Can we actually have a classification theorem for all connected graphs where the small, smallest eigenvalue is in this gap minus lambda star and the minus two. Okay. Hence, you know, kind of it extends the theorem of camera at all. And maybe this is too difficult to do because of some small graphs that are, you know, very annoying to deal with. A uh, first step would be nice, it would be nice to classify all those graphs with sufficiently many vertices. You know, maybe when the graph is large, you know, you see, you know, the, it's easy to classify. And you know, same question can be asked for sine graphs. And finally, you know, uh, it's still open to determine this for this um, you know spherical two distance set whenever this, these two parameters are in the range. So p is at least three, and lambda is at least lambda, lambda star. And let me end my talk here. Thank you for attention. Very good. Thanks for the talk. Everybody be sure to react and Thank you. let's do questions.